Hitler's main plans were focused on the East, but with the outbreak of war, new plans were needed for the West as well. Central to these plans in the West was the New Order, which was just turning Germany into a global power, so it was all incredibly vague. In many regards, they seemed to have been caught off guard with what to do with conquered countries, so many plans were contradictory and constantly changing. It seems some countries would just be annexed, like the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Switzerland, as I've mentioned before. Yet Denmark, which fell quickly, was said to become a model protectorate. This may be because they were seen as fellow Nordics, or because their king, Christian X, almost quietly cooperated with the Nazis, while at the same time, becoming a figurehead for resistance. So Denmark was left alone, albeit under German control. For this reason, it would be hard to believe that Quisling's government in Norway would have been granted Danish colonies. But the British had already invaded Iceland, and the Americans moved into Greenland to stop them falling under Nazi control and giving the Allies control over the Atlantic. However, should the Nazis have won, we can expect that these would be returned to Denmark, or maybe turned into a Nazi base. The King of Belgium also remained in his country as others fled, but Belgium was far more complicated. Far-right Flemish groups like the VNV wanted to unite with the Dutch, and they provided thousands of soldiers to the SS. But the Walloon Legion was also a large force in the SS, and they were backed by the far-right Rexus Party, a French-speaking Catholic group that wanted to keep Belgium united. In the middle of this, King Leopold III was under house arrest and banned from entering politics. We do know that Belgium would lose a bit of their German-speaking lands, and the military government they installed there actually incorporated parts of France into it, like Dunkirk. But as for the future of this state, it's all guesswork. Potentially a small French-speaking state, with Flanders brought into Germany. Hitler in fact favoured the Flemish, saying, they have indeed shown themselves on the Eastern Front to be more pro-German and more ruthless than the Dutch legionnaires. However, he goes on to claim Mussolini made some remarks in the Walloons, saying, He groups the Flemish and the Dutch on one side, and the Walloons and the French on the other. The solution which he is inclined to dangle before the eyes of a small minority of Walloons is hardly practicable within the framework of the greater German state. I propose solving the problems of these small states by means of brief and decisive declarations. The solutions the Duce had weren't clearly spelled out, but Hitler said he didn't arrest King Leopold because his Italian friends begged him not to. So maybe Mussolini was just trying to find allies in the north. After all, many staunch Catholics in Walloon were happy to secure independence, like Leon de Grel and the Rexus party. Going into France, the same problem existed. Along with the occupied area around Dunkirk, a zone in the east of the country was said to be inhabited by Germans, and Italy occupied parts of France along their border and also Corsica. Meanwhile, even though the Vichy government was set up in the south, they were expected, at the end of the war, to regain most of their country back. After all, their capital was still, on paper, Paris. But then there was also Brittany. There, some on the far right adopted pan-Celtic ideas, and were inspired by the Easter Rising and independence of Ireland. Groups began to incorporate Nordicism into their own Celtic pasts, developing the idea of Celto-Nordism. They formed groups called the Black and White, and tried to emulate the tactics of the IRA. Some, like Celestine Lane, became obsessed with the ancient Celts, and took part in neo-pagan services with Druids. However, even though some of them collaborated with the Nazis, Hitler signed the Montoir Agreement with Philip X. In this, they just handed Brittany back over to the French. Lane saw this deal as a betrayal, but maybe in the future, this question of Brittany would have been revisited. It may seem strange that Hitler didn't want to break up France into as many pieces as possible. However, a new idea was emerging, the creation of a European Confederation, which was put forward by Ribbentrop in 1943. The leaders of the conquered states and Nazi allies would meet in Salzburg in some early Nazi version of the EU. They believed that after the war, countries that weren't invaded, like Switzerland, Spain, Sweden and Portugal, would join in, thus the entire continent would be under their control. However, they'd need to settle a number of border issues, like between Hungary and Romania, or even Italy and France. Plus, much like the EU, 
it would be an economic union with many trade barriers removed and potentially only one currency. Members would also supply men to the Waffen-SS and many people were keen on this idea, like Pierre Laval in France, who was even willing to allow the Germans to occupy the north for far longer and surrender land to the Italians like Tunisia, if, in time, they would be allowed to return to a position appropriate to its continental and colonial past. Hitler was completely dismissive of the idea in 1943, however, again, this always changed. Earlier in the war, he claimed a good example from history to follow was the Austrian Empire. What a mosaic, what an astonishing conglomeration it contained, and yet it held together. No one has the right to say that minority government is a monopoly of British genius. Yet, focusing on these northwestern countries, there were all sorts of ideas thrown out. Even though Hitler initially agreed to hand the rest of France back over to the Vichy, he later said, In Paris we'll probably have a second French government. If we succeeded in forming a second French government in Paris, the opposition in Vichy would only have one wish, that we would stay, for fear that it should be discovered how many of them are paid by us. Then he goes on to say, Fundamentally speaking, Belgium, France and Norway are not our natural enemies. I have no desire to incorporate all Frenchmen into the Reich. So we could have potentially two French governments each at each other's throats. Gorin, on the other hand, had a meeting in 1940 in his headquarters. There they advocated for an independent Brittany, but also northern France could well have been Germanicized. As they said, the north was historically Nordic, but there was a clerical Masonic South, and they had a blood that will always be foreign to us. Belgium, they agreed, would be divided with Brussels becoming a free city, but ideas are also in the air concerning Belgium. Special treatment of Flemings there, creation of a Burgundian state. So bringing back the old medieval kingdom of Burgundy was also a possibility, spreading into France. Himmler wanted people from Tyrol to create this state in the Eastern Territory, but Hitler wanted them in Crimea. So Himmler said, for Burgundy, we'll just have to find another Germanic ethnic group. Goebbels also expanded on this idea in 1942, saying when the war ends, France will have to pay dearly for she caused and started it. She has now been thrown back to her borders of AD 1500. This means that Burgundy will again become part of the Reich. And this will not be the only time that they bring back the idea of re-establishing the borders of the Holy Roman Empire. Then Hitler later remarked that he would not give up any bases on the Atlantic coast. So maybe two French states, but remarkably small French states, a German coast, and an independent Burgundy and Brittany. But also, there were plans to create a strong France in a European confederation. Again, this was all hypocritical and kept on changing. Plus, back at that meeting, they called for the annexation of Luxembourg again, and even Norway. And although no serious attempts were made to annex all of Norway, they did look to create a colony there, Nordstern. This would have been a city along the Great Atlantic Wall with a huge port, allowing the Germans to defend the continent at sea. This wall would stretch all the way down through France, then possibly Spain, and maybe into Africa. Thus, they would build a castle almost around Europe, with the Urals and the Living Wall on the east and the Atlantic Wall on the west. Other German colonies were needed to protect this, and Cherbourg and Brest were also contenders for German colonies. Nordstern in particular would have also protected their interests in Scandinavia, securing Swedish iron ore for good. As for Sweden, Göring believed that it would just become part of Germany, almost like the Bavaria of the north. Whereas Himmler and Goebbels regretted not invading it, as Goebbels wrote in his diary, this state has no right to national existence anyway. Himmler also spoke of handing the north of Sweden over to the Finnish, but this seems unlikely. After all, Finland was not Germanic, and many ethnic Swedes in Finland joined the SS battalion there. So generally, Hitler was unwilling to see any Nordic states unite or expand. For instance, Quisling unsuccessfully hoped for a greater Nordic peace union. So more than likely, Sweden would have become a puppet initially, with Sven Olaf Lindholm in charge. He ran the small Nazi party of Sweden, and even drew up a list of Jewish people ready to be killed. But that's just speculation, maybe it could have been turned into a model protectorate like Denmark. Moving across the North Sea, there's Britain, who Hitler hoped for a long time would just join the Axis. As he said, 
If the British Empire collapsed today, Russia would take India, Japan would take Eastern Asia, the United States would take Canada. I couldn't even prevent the Americans from gaining a firm hold in Africa. In the case of England being sunk, I would have no profit, but the obligation to fight her successors. So he proposed alternatives, like offering the British free control of India in exchange for abandoning Europe to Germany. And he was quite hopeful of this, saying, I'm sure that 99% of them would choose to keep India. He also talked quite highly of the English upper classes, who he considered to be Germanic. And he was particularly impressed by their role in conquering and ruling over India. Some like Hans F. K. Gunter even believed that the Anglo-Saxons, Normans and Vikings kept the English even more Germanic than the Germans themselves. While even the Scots, Welsh and Irish were at least a little bit Germanic thanks to Viking raids. But they largely believed the future of Britain should be one like Austria in the 19th century. They both ruled over a mix of nationalities and were once dominant. But after they lost to Prussia, or in this case Germany, they should fall in line and become the second power in an alliance. In the mid-1930s, a naval agreement between the two countries gave Hitler hope. And when Ribbentrop met with the British, he made promises to send German divisions to Britain for help in defending their colonies. Even in 1940, Franz Halder wrote, We are seeking contact with Britain on the basis of partitioning the world. Then, should they agree, Hitler envisioned that England and Germany march together against America, starting with chasing them out of Iceland and then Greenland. But still Britain fought on after France fell. Yet in 1942 there was still hope for Hitler. With the fall of Singapore the curtain falls on the Far East. The hope that the Russian winter would destroy us is in the process of disappearing. As soon as everybody in England is convinced that the war can only be run at a loss, it's certain that there won't be anyone left there who feels inclined to carry on with it. So they planned on waiting until Britain just sort of joined the Axis. However, once again more plans were in play, like Operation Willy. This was a plan to kidnap the former king, Edward VIII, as he fled through Spain. Then, as he was somewhat sympathetic to the Nazis, they would make him the new puppet ruler of an Axis partner. This would allow the Nazis to almost keep the British Empire in their domain, and importantly, keep their navy. Thus, they could together prepare for a war against the United States in the future. However, other plans were a little more dark. For instance, Walter von Brauchitz said, the able-bodied male population be interned and dispatched to the continent. So, most British people should be enslaved, essentially. And Himmler, in 1943, wanted to kill up to 80% of the population of France and Britain. Parts of the United Kingdom, like the Channel Islands, would become holiday resorts for the German workers, and the locals were to be educated to embrace their Norman heritage over their ties with England. There was, of course, an invasion plan, Operation Sea Lion, but this only really envisioned invading the southeast. And then, it seems, the rest of Britain was just expected to surrender. Maybe the Germans would have remained in the southeast like they had done in northern France, while a puppet government would be set up, and there were a couple contenders for the new leader. Obviously, Oswald Mosley was an option, but so too was David Lloyd George. This is because the Nazis drew up a list of everybody who needed to be killed in their black book, which included all the exiled leaders of conquered lands, prominent socialists, and politicians who advocated for war. But Lloyd George, the leader during World War I, spoke of peace, and would have been a more widely accepted puppet ruler than the fascist Mosley. He was also Welsh, but Wales wasn't really mentioned in any of their plans. The Nazis did speak of the Welsh, saying, Unlike the bright English, they are dark and small in stature. Even though they have largely abandoned their language, they have still retained a reasonably strong awareness of their distinctive heritage and culture. So, it seems they would try to get rid of any Welsh nationalism, and they would just be kept under some form of English rule. In the north, there were very small movements among the Scottish to support the Nazis. Some of the early members of the SNP, for instance, debated the idea of German assistance, but in these early years, the movement was somewhat confused. Hugh MacDiarmid, for instance, wrote a plea for Scottish fascism, but he later joined the Communist Party. During the war, he said, On balance I regard the Axis powers, though more violently evil for the time being, less dangerous than our own government in the long run, and indistinguishable in purpose. And then, if the Germans win, they could not hold their gain for long. 
but if the French and British win, it will be infinitely more difficult to get rid of them. Then a future SNP leader, Arthur Donaldson, had his home raided during the war because he apparently told an MI5 agent that, if the Germans invaded, he planned on establishing a puppet state. But no evidence was produced and he wasn't charged. Finally, in 1943, a message reached the German ambassador in Dublin proposing the establishment of a Scottish Republic, which would be a weapon in the fight against the gross materialism of the capitalistic, communistic union of English, Americans, Bolsheviks, etc. Weapons should be sent to the country, and then they would unite with Ireland, possibly even Cornwall, and a distretched Brittany, to create a Celtic Union with its headquarters in Dublin. However, we don't know who sent this message, and even the British Secret Services dismissed the whole movement as being too small. There were some Germans, like Gerhard von Tevener, who were keen Celtic scholars, but this movement also seems pretty small. So, potentially only initially, Scotland would be granted some degree of autonomy. To the west though, Gestapo documents declared, Ireland should be occupied, as the shortest distance from England to Ireland is 20 kilometres, and therefore many Englishmen would try to escape by motorboat. So there were some plans to land in Ireland, like Operation Green in August 1940. This could well have been a false plan though, and just designed to divert resources away from Britain. But the Germans did have connections with the IRA, and they discussed an invasion of Northern Ireland as part of Plan Kathleen. Inside Ireland, there were the Blue Shirts, led by Ewan O'Duffy, who tried to launch a march on Dublin way back in 1933. However, after fighting alongside Franco in Spain, his power began to wane by the outbreak of the war. But as a side note, one of the major political parties in Ireland emerged partly from this movement. So Hermann Gortz looked to the IRA, but didn't believe they could really help as their leader, Stephen Hayes, lacked leadership qualities and became weak from alcohol and fear. During one meeting he said, Hayes then told me that the IRA had no weapons for any sort of major action. When I learned of all that was needed in the way of weapons, I wondered exactly what was the military value of the IRA. So the plan was pretty much dropped, but Sean Hayes and the IRA did launch a bombing campaign in Britain regardless, known as S-Plan. And Hitler later said, Ireland's neutrality must be respected. A neutral Irish free state is of greater value to us than a hostile island. And Goring later revealed to one of the commanders, Do not trouble yourself needlessly about Ulster. The Fuhrer does not want to invade Great Britain. From now on, Gibraltar will be the main task for you. Ireland therefore would later be occupied to stop the British people from fleeing there, and then possibly unified. On Gibraltar though, to get there, obviously the Nazis needed to go via Spain. However, Franco asked for far too much from the Germans to join the Axis. At one meeting with Hitler, he requested a vast amount of supplies and French Morocco, Cameroon, and also an expansion of Spanish Guinea. Meanwhile, the Italians were claiming French Tunisia, but Hitler still wanted to keep Vichy France on his side. So handing away too much French territory would upset this balance. So Spain didn't yet join the Axis. And I say he wanted to keep the Vichy government on his side, not because there was a risk of them joining the Allies, but rather an alliance within an alliance. This was called the Latin Bloc, and Mussolini and Franco could well have pulled the Vichy government and possibly Salazar's Portugal into a new sphere to challenge Hitler. Hitler was sometimes in favour of these plans, but also realised they were impossible, saying in Spain there were two movements. The Papists wished to see the monarchy restored, and the old close ties with Great Britain renewed. Franco has evil designs on the French North African possessions. The Falangists aspire to Gibraltar and a good slice of the Oran province. The danger of a pan-Latin bloc disappears owing to the enormous demands which its inauguration would make on France. In the face of them, France will turn to us for protection. I must make the Duce understand that, to meet a possible attempt at invasion by the British, I would much prefer to have a quiet and contented France but he was still wary of the possibility. The most evil spirit is undoubtedly Serrano Suner, whose task it is to prepare the way for the Latin Union. I'm quite sure that Serrano Suner was goaded on by the clergy. His plan was to found a Latin Union of France, Italy and Spain, and then to range it at Britain's side, the whole to have the blessing of the Archbishop of Canterbury, 
and a little spicing of communism for good measure. So keeping France on his side was essential at this point anyway. Nevertheless, the Germans did draw up plans to invade Gibraltar via Spain as part of Operation Felix. But Franco was reluctant to allow it, as he suspected he would lose Spanish islands in the Atlantic if Britain got involved. But the fact they didn't go ahead with this plan was a big regret of many. Like Wilhelm Kietel said, instead of attacking Russia, we should have strangled the British Empire by closing the Mediterranean. And also Goring wanted to offer Britain the right to resume peaceful traffic through the Mediterranean if she came to terms with Germany and joined us in a war against Russia. Otherwise, next to Spain was Portugal, a country who balanced an old alliance with Britain and a shift towards authoritarianism under Salazar. The Germans didn't seek out bringing this country under their control right away, but there was Operation Isabella, which would come into play after victory in the USSR. This would have seen the Nazis occupy both Portugal and Spain, should the British use the peninsula as a base. Obviously this didn't happen, so the only real bits of Portuguese territory that the Germans wanted were their Atlantic islands, like the Azores. Hitler had to be talked down from launching such a risky operation to seize the islands, but the Azores or even Spanish Canary Islands would have given the Nazis a better chance at controlling the Atlantic if an invasion was at all possible. Then moving east through Europe, there's Italy. Although before the war, the Germans signed away their claims to South Tyrol, as the war progressed, this began to change. They argued that most of the prominent Italians from the past were Nordic, and the Roman emperors were Germanic people ruling over Mediterranean people. This was particularly true, they claimed, for the north of the country, which Hitler said was nothing but pure German. They also said the speakers of Frulian and Ladin in the north were pure German, and they should be brought into the Greater German Reich eventually. So when Mussolini first fell, plans were made to annex the North. As the Nazis began to fight the Allies in Italy, new boundaries were drawn up, like the Alpine Footlands and the Adriatic, and these would eventually stretch across to France. Then, as Hitler said, the art of Northern Italy is something we have in common with them. Nothing but pure Germans. The objectionable Italian type is found only in the South. So the regions of Venice, Italian-owned Slovenia, Trieste, and all former Austrian territories were to be brought into Germany itself. And Himmler declared that Switzerland was also bound to be incorporated into the Reich. As for the next French lands, maybe they'd just be returned to a loyal Vichy. This is because, even if victorious, Hitler began to turn against his Italian ally, which I'll get onto later. Otherwise, a Lombard state like that of the old Holy Roman Empire would also be created nearby. As Goebbels wrote, whatever was once an Austrian possession, we must get back into our own hands. The Italians, by their infidelity and treachery, have lost any claim to a national state of the modern type. So the best Mussolini could hope for was to be installed as a puppet ruler of a rump state in the south, and he'd be the final leader that formed the basis of the European Confederation in the west. Mussolini, Franco, Salazar, Quisling, King Edward and others all lesser partners in this union. In Central Europe, Haughty and Hungary would have been included in this as well. Now, Hungary was already given parts of Romania and Yugoslavia, but they still had historic claims to Croatia and the likes. So the Nazis would almost have to act as a referee between any future conflicts. As Hitler remarked, it's clear that the Hungarians and Romanians will never be reconciled. The Hungarians even met with him with little requests from Regent Haughty. I myself should turn a benevolent blind eye if the Hungarians started a fight with the Romanians. To do this, the Hungarians argued, the frontier between Europe and Asia was the line where the Orthodox Church ceased to hold sway. However, Hitler was pretty critical of both the Hungarians and Romanians. Like he described the Hungarians as just good auxiliaries for us, and the Hungarian is as lazy as the Russian. He's by nature a man of the steppe. Plus, from a social point of view, the sickest communities of the new Europe are, first Hungary, then Italy. Romania, though, he believed was under the correct leadership of Ion Antonescu. Before the war, Romania had been part of the Balkan Pact, along with Turkey, Greece and Yugoslavia, and most of the elites were Francophiles. But as the war turned against the Allies, King Carol II joined the Axis. The more radical Iron Guard tried to seize power, but Antonescu crushed them and took over. 
But Romania had already lost Transylvania to Hungary, Bessarabia to the Soviets, and the Treaty of Craiova awarded southern Dobruja to Bulgaria. Dobruja was actually home to around 16,000 Germans, who were also relocated as part of this treaty. To compensate them when they joined the Axis, Romania was given Moldova and Odessa. Yet, it seems that a war against Hungary would erupt later on. And I'd hazard a guess that Hitler would join Antonescu. As he said, of all our allies, it is Antonescu who has the greatest breadth of vision. He has realized that this war gives Romania the chance to become predominant in the Balkans. He expanded on this saying, if the Hungarians go to war with the Romanians, Antonescu will knock the hell out of them. So Romania, with little German backing, may reclaim their lost territories. And Hitler may well have used this as an opportunity to seize Hungary itself. He claimed he listened to the people of Vienna, who were correct in saying, Hungary belongs to us. It was we who liberated the Hungarians from the Turks, and order will not be restored in Hungary until we liberate the country again. This is allegedly what the people of Vienna were saying anyway. He also claimed that the Germans in Hungary assimilated, or in his words, degenerated too quickly. We shan't succeed in preserving the German minorities in Hungary, except by taking over control of the state, or else we shall have to withdraw our minorities from Hungary. Withdrawal was initially the plan in order to gain an ally, but after victory in Europe, I'd say Hungary may have been the first Axis power to collapse, especially given Horty's almost reluctance to join the Axis. Another country that would probably fall after the war was Bulgaria. Tsar Boris was another almost unwilling member of the Axis, despite being given Dobruja and parts of Greece and Yugoslavia when they were invaded. However, the Bulgarians never declared war on the Allies, and they refused to allow volunteers to form an SS division. Hitler also said the population was enthusiastically welcoming a Russian football team. The fact is that Bulgaria is strongly affected by pan-Slavism. She is attracted by Russia, even if Sovietized. However, he also said that the Bulgarians weren't actually Slavic, but rather Turkic. He also thought that the king was unable to really stabilize his country and had very little power. So he began to favor an alliance with the Turkish, saying, There's no obstacle to an alliance between Turkey and the Reich. The same is not true of Bulgaria, which, since it practices the Greek Orthodox religion, finds in it new reasons to feel friendly towards Russia. But before getting onto Turkey, there's Yugoslavia. Prior to the war, there were moves to try and bring the United Country into their orbit. But it was later invaded, and Italy, which had already taken over Albania, expanded into Kosovo. However, when the Italians pulled out of Albania, the Bali Compadar was installed. In addressing the population, von Vix declared, We come to Albania, not as enemy, but as friends. And there is no reason you should be afraid. We shall leave Albania as soon as we consider necessary. Obviously, this could be seen as a way to quell fears, but there weren't really any other designs on the country. So, it appears they would have been somewhat independent and could keep control over their new territories. Many in Greater Albania, especially those in Kosovo, began to speculate that they were almost Aryans of Illyrian heritage. Their volunteer SS unit was seen as useful, but the officers from Albania proper were called totally corrupt, unusable, undisciplined, and untrainable by Joseph Fitzum. Nearby in North Macedonia, when Bulgaria pulled out of the war, this became a very short-lived independent republic. Ivan Mihailov in the IMRO called for the unification of Macedonia, calling it the Switzerland of the Balkans. This is because it would incorporate parts of Greece as well, and it would have been a multi-ethnic state. Although this wasn't the plan initially, should Germany have shifted towards a Turkish alliance, this may have been part of a partition plan, providing, of course, the Italians remained weakened. The Italians, on the other hand, were looking into creating an alliance with the Muslim Bosniaks. But all of Bosnia would have fallen under Croatian rule. In fact, the Italians had actually tried to gain influence over the Ustaji in Croatia, but as the war progressed, the Ustaji chose to align with the Germans instead. Hitler, in fact, spoke quite highly of the Croatians, once saying, what a pity they can't install Croats to rule over the Romanians. Plus, he argued that they were not Slavic at all. He used moustaches as a way to prove this, saying the Czechs grew a drooping Mongol-style moustache, but the Croats didn't. 
So in the future, I must say I think it's highly desirable from the ethnical point of view that they should be Germanicized. He continued, The Croats are a proud people. They should be bound directly to the Führer by an oath of loyalty. The Croats are very keen on not being regarded as Slavs. According to them, they're descended from the Goths. The fact that they speak a Slav language is only an accident, they say. So the Croatians were included as Aryans through a series of laws, but there were still some who wanted to get the Bosnians on side. Himmler in particular was impressed by Islam, and their promises of going to heaven made them perfect soldiers for the SS. So many Bosniaks volunteered, hoping to get their independence, or even just to be annexed by Germany outright. But it seems Hitler would have continued supporting the Ustasi. Otherwise, Montenegro should have been an Italian protectorate, but again, as Italy began to decline, the Germans moved in and established a puppet. This would have been headed by Lubomir Vuksanovic, or maybe Sekula Druljevic, who was an exile in Croatia. The latter already had his own armed forces and began to advocate that Montenegrins were completely different to the Serbs racially and culturally, if not linguistically. He said the Serbs were historically Ottoman slaves, while Montenegrins were free. With their language, the Montenegrin people belonged to the Slavic linguistic community. By their blood, however, they belonged to the Daneric people. Daneric peoples are descended from the Illyrians, all the way from the Albanians to the South Tyrolians, who are Germanized Illyrians. So Montenegro would be free, under possibly more Croatian influence initially. Finally, there was Serbia. Croatia had already taken Smyrna, Hungary took Bačka, and Banat became an autonomous region. This had been home to a German population for over a century. Yet, even though Hitler repatriated many other communities, this community remained put. They hoped to become part of the Reich in a new province named after Prince Eugene of Savoy, but this was initially rejected. However, an autonomous region was created for other reasons. As Croatia, Hungary and Romania all claimed this territory, it could be used as a bargaining chip in future negotiations. Plus, it became part of a larger plan to expand into Serbia itself. But before that, Serbia was turned into a puppet state under Milan Nedic. He seemed incredibly keen on the new order of Europe, celebrating the new world will elevate Serbia to its rightful and honourable place in the new Europe. Under the new leadership of Germany, we look courageously into the future. Nedic actually took a very active role in collaborating with German ambitions, so much so that Belgrade was declared to be Jew-free. He had hopes of cementing control over a greater Serbia, and argued that the Croatians were unable to stabilise the region. Some Nazis like Hermann Nubaka pushed for this plan, and Goebbels wrote in his diary about Nedic, the Fuhrer believes he can make good use of him in re-establishing order in Serbia. Yugoslavia was, after all, in a chaotic state, filled with different ethnic groups, communist partisans, and nationalist Chetniks. The Chetniks, for example, would sometimes collaborate, but then again sometimes fight against the Germans. Plus, the Italians had been there, and Bulgarian soldiers were used to help occupy the country. They could well have used the Chetniks more to fight against the communists, but Yodel claimed Hitler said, A Serbian army must not be allowed to exist. It is better to have some danger from communism. So, once the war was won, Serbia would cease to exist. Plus, as I mentioned before, Hitler had other ideas. As he said, my Viennese compatriots ask continuously whether we shall once more abandon Belgrade. Now that we've captured the place for the third time, they say, we ought to stick to it. He agreed with this and believed German influence should expand along the Danube, especially around the Iron Gates. This is just a gorge along the Serbian-Romanian border, but Hitler believed it was essential to control. In no circumstances can we renounce our claim to the so-called Iron Gates. The Danube is a river that runs deep into the heart of the continent, and for this reason must, in a new Europe fashioned by us, be regarded as a German stream. Plus, the river of the future is the Danube. We'll connect it to the Dnieper and the Don by the Black Sea. The petroleum and grain will come flowing towards us. Add to this the canal from the Danube to the Oder, and we'll have an economic circuit of unheard of dimensions. He believed it would be hard to attract settlers there, if not for the abundant resources. However, if he did find a couple thousand settlers, I'll build an autobahn 1500 kilometers long, dotted at intervals of 50 to 100 kilometers, with German agglomerations 
including some important towns. So it seems that the Germans would begin to slowly establish their control over the Danube. And Belgrade would become a fortress city, central to Germany's defence, but Hitler never really specified who he'd be defending himself from there. Plus, as Hitler said, the Danube is also the link with Turkey. However, before getting on to Turkey, there's Greece. It was claimed that the ancient Spartans were the first ever folkish state, and the most racially pure in history. Hitler argued, the Germanic needed a sunny climate to enable his qualities to develop. It was in Greece and Italy that the Germanic spirit found the first terrain favourable to its blossoming. He went on to say that it took longer in colder climates like Scandinavia. He also said, when we are asked about our ancestors, we should always point to the Greeks. However, there's no real record of Hitler having many ambitions on the state itself. The Germans did invade, merely to support the Italian invasion, and Greece was partitioned. The new Hellenic state was created, and a puppet government was attempted to be installed. But they struggled to find any real concrete leadership. So, generally, very little was said about the future of such a state. Yet, it should be said that Greek resistance was so fierce that many claimed it delayed the invasion of the Soviet Union and ultimately doomed the German war effort. So, Europe was redrawn. But going out of the continent, there were obviously some other bold plans. 